Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Optimizing Mother podcast. I'm here today with Sarah to Sobel, who's the creator of Relation Shift. That's Relation Shift, which is a liberating approach to releasing hurt and creating connection in marriage. And you'll hear more from Sargita herself. So hi, Sargita. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yes, we're so lucky to have you. And I'd love to hear from you a little bit about yourself and a little bit about what you do and what relationship is all about. Sure. I help women create joyful homes and marriages, uh, despite whatever challenges they may be facing currently through coaching and workshops and retreats. And I also train teams of coaches to do the same. As you know, this podcast is the Optimizing Mother Podcast. And as mothers, we're looking to optimize our mothering, our effectiveness in chinuch and in education. So in this context, in the context of education and being a mother, what would you say is important to know or to remember about relationships and specifically shalom bias between a woman and her husband? It's a great question. So I think that it is very, very easy to dismiss the effect of shalom bias on our children. It often seems like the immediate chinuch needs of the child are more pressing and needs to be de- addressed, you know, regardless of the relationship, especially if the father seems to be handling the child wrong. However, when we take a closer look, you know, it's actually apparent that shalom bias, the shalom bias itself, the relationship between the parents has a very powerful effect on our children. Um, you know, just a few examples spiritually, right? The transmission of Torah values in our home can only be done in a space of Shalom, as we see the prerequisite for Matan Torah was Shalom. You know, the rabbi addresses this in the in a, in a Sicha and Shavuos, and he says, In order to receive Torah, you need this introduction, this preface, this space of Avas Yisrael, and that can't be more true than in our homes. Emotionally, I mean, it's pretty self-apparent. <laughs> Emotionally, a child's emotional well-being very much depends on the emotional climate in the home. And physically, even down to the physical health, physical mental health of a child. Uh, again, I quote a letter of the Rebbe in um, Igris Kodesh, Chela Yud, volume 10, where the Rebbe writes very specifically that the increased degree of shalom bias will also cause an increase in blessings and success, including strengthening the health of your children. So when we look at the critical areas that we want our children to grow and thrive and develop into, shalom bias has a foundational effect on their development. So I hear that. And it, it, it is inspiring. And I would say probably a lot of people want that. You know, they don't, never want to sacrifice shalom bias for the sake of chinuch. But what about when a mother feels like she practically is disagreeing with something her husband's doing? Mm-hmm. And she does feel like it's coming at the expense of chinuch. And, and it almost feels like there's a choice. Either I'm compromising on my child's chinuch or I'm compromising on shalom bias. And how do I practically keep and ensure the peace in the home when there's, you know, when I want to intervene with, let's say, as you said, with, you know, the way the husband is doing something. Right. Right. It is, it is scary. It's, um, it's, a can be overwhelming to see your husband interacting with the child in a way that feels like it's compromising the child's well-being, And, you know, it's something that a lot of mothers face. So the first thing that we really want to do is take a look at whether intervening is actually helping or making things worse. And um, really taking it on this look, like how many years have you been trying to get him to be more sensitive to this one or more firm with that one? Chances are he's, you know, in my experience, he's not thanking you for your insight and just uh, thrilled that you've given him this, uh, the context of how he should be relating to a particular child. Really, very probably, if you take a look honestly, it's probably escalating stress in your home, which is something that a lot of women are surprised to see when we actually take a step back and notice. Like, here I am, it's been five years, 10 years of trying to get my husband to be a different way. 
with, you know, a particular child or with all the children in general, and something does not seem to compute. So we really want to ask ourselves some hard questions. When you see, a, a you know, your husband handling a child and it feels wrong, really, what is at stake? And is the way I'm approaching it helping? If it's not helping, what is it costing me to keep on trying to get him to see and change his ways? And if that cost is not worth it, then how about trying something different to perhaps get different results? It almost feels like, though, like if he would just not do that, then I would just not have this issue. Right. Right. It's logical. And the things that we're saying seem very logical to us, too. And that's why we have to really take a look at, well, how long have we been asking him not to do that. So the reality is it's not working. (laughs) Right. So what's that other, so what's that other approach that you suggest? Yeah. So one thing that's very important is to notice first and foremost, that we actually have a different role as mothers than our husbands do as fathers. And because we're women and because we have a feminine nature, we naturally value, the feminine value system. We see the world through our feminine value system. So we naturally don't attribute value to the way our husbands do things because it's so different than our value system. Just, you know, to give a little context, um, as women, we know that our, we are spiritually aligned. Our spiritual source is Bina, Gabura, Haid, Malfas. These are the feminine spheres. And basically the way that this expresses itself is in valuing, nurturing, discipline, routines, connecting to the child and the child's level. We also know that as a mother, we provide the child with his essential sense of self. The neshama comes from the mother. So, and this is mirrored in the way we relate to the child. You know, we want to understand the child and his what he's going through, where his emotions are coming from. And also that essential sense of feeling that he's worthy no matter what. I mean, this is what as mothers, we give that child that neshama, that core value of no matter what, this is who you are. Whereas the father, on the other hand, has a completely different spiritual alignment. His The spirits that he's connected with is chachma, direction, uh, vision, chesed, generosity, love, netzach, endurance, competition, winning, striving. And the father, we see, gives the child a definitive sense of self. Right, he gives the child what shade that he comes from, the sense that accomplishment is what gives you value, not just limited to who you're being. So sometimes things that the father is coming forward with is actually part of his role. There's a beauty as mothers to get into the child's world and really support them where they are. And there's also a beauty to inspire a child to strive to something beyond what they're where they're at right now. Um, and to us, it might seem harsh or not understanding, but when we put it in the context of actually the husband is contributing to the child and he's in line with his role as a father, it takes a lot of the danger out of the way he's interacting with him. Okay. I hear, I hear about shifting to valuing the specific contributions um, of a father, but like, let's get practical. You know, you mentioned harshness. What if there's a woman who's afraid her husband's being a little bit too tough and not understanding her her son? Mm -hmm. Um, Or what if you're disagreeing on something that you believe is either hashkafic or emotional well-being for the child? The mother feels the kid Mm -hmm. should not have any screen time and the father will just let the kids watch a video. Mm -hmm. How do you handle, I guess, preserving the shalom bias and at the same time, I'll be like, hey, what's happening to the kids? What's happening with the kind of care? Yeah, it's a great question. So let so first of all, a little disclaimer. Um, we're not going to be addressing acute situations here. We definitely address it in private coaching and one-on-one, but in a podcast form, we're gonna keep it more generic. So, okay, so let's say the woman is feeling that her husband is, you know, uh, being too harsh, or you know, he has certain hashkafic values that she very at a fundamental level, disagrees with. You know, like, what do you do with that? The child is being compromised emotionally or spiritually. First things first, we're back to the first question. Is telling her husband helping? 
is trying to get him to stop being harsh with this particular child. Does that help? Right. So it, it doesn't to, help, but then there's the frustration of what about the chinuch? Yes. Yeah. So what's amazing is, is that there's, as soon as the woman is willing to see value in her husband and step away from that, from the disapproval and from the, you know, the, the need to direct and correct and improve him, what we find more and more is that because once the husband feels respected and valued as the mashpia in his home, he actually steps up and and will recognize things on his own that for years she had been trying to get him to recognize all along. And I've seen this over and over in so many ways. I'll give you an example. So one woman who was struggling with how her husband was running their Shabbos table. This is an anonymous story with permission from the, from the woman. And she was really, really struggling with how her husband was running the Shabbos table and she wanted him to connect to their kids. She wanted him to be more firm with the kids. So the way it was playing out was that there was a lot of, you know, a lot of chaos. The kids would be misbehaving and he would either ignore them or he would snap at them. And it was just the whole Shabbos meal was very unpleasant. So we looked at first, how's the way she was dealing with it until now? Was it, was it working? Was it helping? Pointing it out like, you know, so-and-so he needs a firm hand or, or pointing out like, look, if you're going to say it's our Tyra, like get the kids involved. Be you're saying the wife was trying to quote unquote manage the husband and how he's running this child's meal. Right. So she's right. giving these suggestions to make she's things better. Suggestions or even just deep, loud sighs, like, you know, like those sighs you can give or those looks we like, can get give. get your act together. Exactly. Don't you see, you know, so whether she said it or not, her energy was was shouting it loud and clear. So what happened? What happened was her husband wasn't exactly jumping out of his chair in appreciation for her insight again. Um, and it just made things worse. Like now, now not only the kids were upset, but she was upset and her husband was upset. So the whole family dynamic was stressed out. Um, so what we looked at was what value can we find in your husband, in your husband running the Shabbos table? And we just, we literally started at ground zero. So what that looked like was she rec- she recognized that um, when her husband was awake for Shabbos, something was missing at the table. It wasn't the same with her sitting at the head and making Kiddush. So obviously her husband was contributing with his presence, even though it wasn't perfect. So we started there, finding value in how her husband was showing up for her family, for her children at the Shabbos table just by his presence. She began telling him, saying, recognizing, you know, I so appreciate your presence at our Shabbos table. There's, you, you add so much value. You run such a beautiful Shabbos table. Some of the things felt like a stretch, but when she again compared it to what it was like when he wasn't there, she saw that it actually was true. So from that space, things started shifting. Her husband, once he felt valued, responded in kind, and became more present. And when things would get out of hand with the child, instead of sitting there and glaring at her husband, she chose to take a step away and just, you know, take a drink or breathe in the kitchen, or maybe even step outside quickly for a breath of fresh air and come back in when it was quieter. And then once again, she could appreciate her husband for handling, you know, whatever fallout had been happening. So Within a few months, the whole dynamic around our Shabbos table changed from one of stress and control and resentment to one of ease and something that was enjoyable for the whole family. So this is just like a little example of when we allow ourselves to take a step away from this evaluating of how my husband's handling a child, like, oh, it's too harsh. Step back for a second, right? Notice, is my noticing it, getting involved, helping? If not, what can I value about my husband's presence in this child's life? And start from there. You could start from something very basic. That will build more gentleness into your home than, you know, trying to correct or show him a better way. So you're saying even when it comes to a hashkatha or wanting to do things better, ultimately it's better for the children to keep and restore that respect and that will ultimately impact them better. Is there ever a place to, to suggest or correct your husband? 
Right. So actually, I just want to make a distinction because the example I was given was more of style with a child. Hashkafic is a little bit of a different area. Now, can I address that? Sure. Love it. Okay. So let's say you have a hashkafic difference. Okay. First things first, we have to understand that hashkafically, what is the point of this particular hashkafa? The point is adding Kedusha into our homes, right? Like we have to look at the end of the day. What are we trying to gain by upholding a particular value? So if my point at the end of the day is to bring Kedusha into my home, I really need to get present to what brings Shrina into our homes. And we know Chazal say that Shalom brings down the Shrina. The base of Mekdash was destroyed because of a lack of Shalom. It's Shalom in the home is huge, huge, huge. So just to know yourself that if you choose Shalom in this area of Hashkafa and respect your husband's values, even if it seems lower, and I'm not saying you should, we're going to get to how you can actually address Hashkafa. But just the baseline of that, you are bringing Kedusha into your home by choosing Shalom Bias. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't have a say and you don't have a voice. And if your husband says, you know, is bringing you videos, you can't say anything, you could. But when we feel threatened by something, what we're communicating is, if I'm communicating from a place of feeling threatened, then he is not going to hear the opportunity to discuss a value. All he's going to hear is that I'm threatened by him. It becomes, it, it, it's a, it, he's going to get defensive. So the, the communication shuts down when I have a negative energy and an intensity around a particular topic. So by getting really present to the fact that choosing Shalom Bayes brings Kedusha, and this Hashkafik is something that will add, will enhance, but it's not the core Kedusha in my home then um, you can actually have a conversation about it. So the way to have a conversation around the Ashkafic value or difference of opinion is by first clearing myself from the fear around his value so that when I speak, he can actually hear what I'm saying versus the implied criticism, and then finding value in what he's contributing. So first of all, you want to really define what is bothering you about this particular Ashkafa. What do you feel is going to go missing because of this difference of Ashrafa? Once I have that down, uh, now I have a direction because I've taken the I've taken the obscurity out of what exactly it is that I'm afraid about with this particular Ashrafa, and then I can question myself: like, is this true? Is this difference in Ashrafa really compromising that issue? Okay, if it is, and again. This is all hard to do on your own. It, it does take skill to navigate, but, um, you know, I'm just laying out the steps here. So if you feel it is being compromised, then absolutely it needs to be addressed. However, it needs to be addressed from a space of respect. Respect doesn't mean that I am listening to you or doing what you say. Respect simply means I make space for you. For your opinion, and I find value in. So creating space for and finding value in is the definition of respect. So any conversation that I want to hold that's going to be about a difference of opinion, ashkafa, value, has to come from this basis of giving you space for you and whatever you whatever uh, opinion you're coming forward with, um, and finding value in it. And again, finding value doesn't mean I agree with it. It just means I find value. So let's say, you know, the issue on the table is screen time. Um, You want to know what are you feeling is compromised. So if it's, um, you know, mental, if if it's like health of the child shouldn't be on screen, that would be one thing to address. If it's Kedusha, it would be another way to address. Let's say it's Kedusha. Okay, so we want to look at you know, where does your husband bring Kedusha into your children's lives? Really find value that your husband does. And he does. If you're looking at it, there's many little things that you can point to um, that you can find that add value. Just like by the Shabbos table, start with his presence. Uh, and like we said before, Shalom Bias 
again, that itself brings Kedusha into the home. So, um, so you want to get really clear on your husband is not compromising the Kedusha of your child across the board. It's just this one little issue that you want to discuss. So once you have it, once you really see the value that your husband does bring in Kedusha, then I can address this, right? In that context, how big is this issue? Sometimes you'll notice, actually, that issue is not as big as I thought it was, and it's just worth it to drop. And by focusing on all the other ways your husband is showing up for the kids, you're going to see more of it. And it, it becomes like a non-issue. If you still feel there's something to discuss about it, then you can bring up your desire. You know, I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about our, our kids at screen time, and I really would love to minimize it. What do you think? So without the threat that this is, you know, compromising core values that they have, it becomes something you can discuss a lot more easily because he can actually hear you as opposed to feeling threatened. And, and that's really across the board with any hashgraphic difference, right? The first thing you want to target is fundamentally, is this hashgrapha really at stake? And where, where can you find fundamentally that he is adding in that particular value in your home? Once you have that down, discussing the details is like, is, is easy because there's no threat there. Okay, what about, you know, the way we were brought up hearing things like, Bina Yasera and Mithal the Isha, that the women have more Bina Yasera. So how would that fit in with what you're saying about, you know, valuing the contribution or both? Like, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we usually think of Bina Yasera, meaning that the woman knows better. <laughs> and really, if you think about it, it doesn't take much Bina to know better than somebody else. If you look deeper at what Bina Yasera means, Bina is connected with Gvura, it's right on my Bina Gvura, and it's connected with fear. Bina Yaseira means that I have a an ability to discern beyond the fear and find that deeper intuition, which is what we tap into when we start seeing and celebrating value in our husbands. Wow, never thought of it in that way. What about when you feel like you want your husband to take more initiative in something that will affect the well-being of the children. Um, you know, it's not personality type when it comes to raising, it's not much mm -hmm. but it's affecting their well-being. Like let's say even practically you want your husband to be more of a go-getter, go buy a house, go make more money, go, you know, where a woman wants, you know, it, it starts affecting the shell and bias because a woman feels that he's not doing enough of mm -hmm. what she thinks he should be doing. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one also. Um, again, we want to go back to, well, has encouraging him to work more or to take initiative, has that actually inspired him to do more and to take initiative? And usually we find that it doesn't, right? If we really take an honest look at ourselves, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't, it's not inspiring. So, what happens if he, you wish he would show up, take initiative in a way that would um, contribute to your home? So again, we go back to Tyra. Um, this is the Zaihar the Rebbe quotes very, very often that um, when we shine a radiant face to the Abishter, Hashem, re uh, Hashem responds in kind. And the, you know, our relationships, husband, wife mirrors our relationship with Hashem. We see that all over Tyra as well. So, um, when we are projecting and, and the desire continues and says the opposite also, right? So when we are projecting a not enough countenance and not enough attitude towards our husbands, then it just inspires more of the same. When we are, are radiating in, you know, and celebrating their contribution that not only is it enough, but we actually see abundance in what they are providing, then that elicits more abundance. So it feels counterintuitive because 
very often in the beginning, w- women feel, well, if I say this is enough, then doesn't that mean I'm condoning? Like, and <laughs> how is he ever going to know that we need to move or we need more money? So that's or, very fear-based. Yes. Yes. And really it's the opposite. And really it's the opposite. When we can look at our husbands and, you know, throw our arms open and see like, wow, look at what you're providing. This would not be here if not for you. Then that's an inspiring space. That's a very inspiring space. And again, if you have a desire for home, it doesn't mean you drop it. It's not like you're going under the covers with everything that you want. It just means that when you share what you want, it's not coming from a place of, and we don't have this, and we don't even have this, and I really want this, and we can't have this because you are not providing enough. You know, we won't say those words, but that's the... So it's more like, I'm so grateful. Thanks for this and this and this. And like, I would love to. Okay. So would you say that summing everything we're saying, most important thing for Shalom Bias is finding value um, in our husbands as mothers. So how does that come across practically to the kids? What are they seeing? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, Because like I mentioned before, finding value doesn't mean that I'm agreeing, right? And I think this is very important too. Um, you know, a lot of people look at Shalom Bias as, uh, you know, in front of the kids, right? We don't argue in front of the kids or, we, you know, we need to present a united front and then take our, uh, you know, or, or if the child is, is complaining about the father, we have to stand up, no, Tati really loves you, right? Like we're together in this. So this is not about presenting a united front, not at all. Kids feel frustrated and lied to and we act as if we agree, as if he doesn't know the truth. Your child can see behind beyond that. Finding value is, first of all, like we, you know, like we shared before, the feminine value system and the masculine value system, the feminine contribution to the child, the masculine contribution to the child are different. So it's perfectly valid for a child to get different things from his mother and from his father. Not only is it valid, I mean, it's the way Hashem set things up, right? Let's take health food. So for a lot of um, families, you know, health can be a a big sticking point. Uh, The father brings in nosh and the mother is trying to feed the children healthy food. And, you know, like, so she tries to get him to realize that the nosh is not is not healthy for them. So United Front, we don't both have to agree on how to give the nash. I don't have to give nash to my kids if I don't stand for it. But if he does, then I can see the value in it. There's value in making Yiddish kite fun or having a treat or a good memory or a good time with Tati. So, uh, and that's okay. So in other words, it's not about United Front. It's about finding value and seeing that value as valid and, and not needing to be threatened by a different approach. Okay, but Targeta, how do you let go? How do you let go of something that feels earth-shatteringly important to you? Mm-hmm. Even if you know intellectually that, you know, maybe in the big scheme of things, shall bias is more important, but how do you emotionally get yourself to be able to let go and relax Mm-hmm. And appreciate that contribution. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big one. So how do you let go? The first thing we need to realize is that when we have a strong feeling about something, it's because our feelings are born from our thoughts, like we know from time. So if I'm having a strong feeling about something, it's because I have a strong thought about a strong, a strong way of thinking about a particular issue or a belief around a particular issue that's at stake. So it's very, um, letting go is a a very important process of, first of all, recognizing the feeling that I'm having and then identifying the beliefs and the thinking that are contributing to that feeling and asking myself some questions instead of just automatically believing my thinking Right, which is what we tend to do. We often, we usually don't even recognize that there's a, a separation. There's a difference between what I'm feeling and what is. But if we can separate the feeling, identify the thinking behind that feeling, 
And then instead of believing that thinking as automatically true, question it. Is this thinking actually true? Is it something I can control? What's at stake if I try? Is this worth it? Who would I be without this fearful thinking? What would be possible? How would it be possible for me to see this situation differently if I didn't have this fearful thinking there? Do you think that a lot of the lack of shalom bias comes from this, from fear? Yeah. Yeah. I would say so. I would say so. It's like, you know, it's unidentified fear. And I think that a lot of, a lot of us don't know how to separate our interpretation of what's going on from what is actually happening. And that's a really important basis in Shalom Bais because, I mean, you could take anything, take a husband walking in late. If I don't identify that I'm actually thinking something, to me, late can mean he doesn't care, right? Like, boom, it's right there, front and center. Because I thought so, so it must be so. And we don't even realize that that's what we're thinking. It just seems like that's what it is. He's late, I'm not his priority. But if we separate the, you know, if we can separate that he's late, okay, that's what happened. Now, the belief I have around it is that I'm not his priority. Is that really true? Right? I might very much be his priority and he's just like, he just happened to be late. So I can be annoyed at him being late. It could be inconvenience, inconvenience to me and we're waiting for supper and that's not fun, but I don't have the backload, the whole story, the hurt. Would you say that we make things mean things that they don't mean without realizing it? Yeah, naturally, naturally, without realizing it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's um, pretty automatic. So it takes it it takes skill to take a look and say, one second, let's slow down a minute. So yeah, a lot of shalom bias, uh, it comes from fear. And again, we are not dismissing the fear. We're exploring the fear to see what else is there here. And that's very important because, you know, uh, telling myself I'm not feeling something that I am feeling, not helpful. But giving myself the honor of being bigger than limited fear thinking is a beautiful thing to step into. Okay, so I think everything you're sharing is really, really, really incredible. I'm just trying to put it all together. And it almost feels like, the father's parenting, he's doing his thing. The mother's parenting, she's doing her thing. Mm-hmm. How does that come together? You know, so each each one brings value and the children experience that. But how does that work as a unit of two parents raising children together? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, if, I think it's a fear a lot of women have. Like if he's doing his thing and I'm doing my thing, then aren't we supposed to be a team? Do we make decisions together? Are we discussing the child together? So I think this is a really important piece also. The need to do something together. Let's look at that for a second. Sometimes it comes from a place of, I need to approve what my husband's doing so that whatever, whatever we're giving our kids is the right thing. I'm not saying always, just sometimes. It's important to see where the togetherness is coming from. Um, You're saying a form of like micromanaging. Right. Like a form of needing to approve or needing my husband to consult with me, even if a decision is good, like wanting him to consult with me first so that I have a say. Yeah. So what, you know, and we think that that's, that's like ideal co-parenting. In actuality, it, it can be very limiting. So the amazing thing about finding value is that when we're doing it correctly, the way that, you know, the way that we teach here in a relationship, you actually have more of a voice than you've ever had before. Because when I value you, it frees up all that energy like there, for you to value me too. Like there's value that's going both ways. And I find that to be, and and it's so connecting. It's genuinely connecting. So, you know, the question, what about parenting together? You are parenting together. When you are respecting and finding value in what your husband is bringing to your child and you're saying, wow, you're giving Shlaimi such a backbone when it comes to 
following through his responsibilities in school. I so admire that about you. What man is not going to turn around and look at you and say, like, whether he verbalizes it or not, but that feeling of like, yes, and I have my Asia style who's by my side. So there's appreciation, there's admiration, there's connection that's going back and forth. If there's something that I want from my child, I can bring it up. Noticing that Shlaimi is missing, missing a, a, a good group of friends. Like, what do you think? When I'm, when my husband knows he's going to be valued, then that's a conversation. Or he can bring up an opinion or a thought that he was thinking about to me when he knows that he's going to be received and not judged. So, yeah. So, in fact, the, the way it actually plays out in real life is much more togetherness, much more communication and connection around issues, much more uh, willingness to share values versus, you know, needing to stand up for my values or resist, you know, resist what the other one is saying because um, defensiveness or, or fear. So it ends up becoming a much more together process. Okay, so I think you gave us a lot of food for thought over this. So if you had to kind of tie this conversation up with a bow, what would you want to leave us with in terms of when it comes to shown bias and educating and being mechanic the next generation? So to wrap it up, there would be a few things. One would be recognizing your husband's contribution as a father as valid, learning how to recognize it as valid, even when it seems so different and it may even clash it with my own value system to learn how to find the value based on Abishar designed men a certain way and women a certain way and Abishar designed that there's a father and a mother and they both have different contributions but equally valid so that would be number one to really recognize that your husband's approach has value has valid value the second piece that uh, I would put in here is recognizing, like we said in the beginning, how deeply Shalom bias affects my child. So when it comes to what I want to give my child, best thing I can do is to create space and find value in their father. And the last thing that is very important, which we didn't really get a chance to touch on in the podcast, but I'm just going to throw it out there, um, is that very important very important to show and bias is a woman learning how to honor herself because too often we neglect our own well-being and then we turn around and blame our husbands for it and that uh, that's not good for show and bias or raising our children or being able to face our fears courageously it just leaves us in a depleted mindset so very important to honor your voice and to do things that are delightful and fill you with passion, vitality, and allow you to uh, you know, really embrace the, the home and the gifts that Hashem has given you. Wow, wow. I feel so uplifted and inspired. So thank you so much, Sarah Gitta, for taking the time to really explain all this to us and to all the listeners. If anybody wants more information, where can they find you or find the information? CreateRelationships.com. Okay. Okay, thank you for joining us for another episode. Make sure you subscribe to the Optimize Another podcast and tell your friends about it too. Thank you and l'chaim to beautiful Shalom Bias for us all. Thank you. Amen. You're very welcome.